we just had a caller call in and say that it's the settlers that are driving the most genocidal rhetoric against the Palestinian people and that the people who have experienced grief and loss and who who, you know, Lo- the the families of the hostages um or the families of people like this man who was interviewed by Oren Ziv of 972 magazine a progressive magazine in Israel um his name is Maoz Inan I'm sorry if I if I butchered his name here um who had uh, people uh, murdered on October 7th in his family his parents his parents yeah. both wow um speaking outside of a protest tent um out, it, it, or at a, a protest tent um he started it actually outside of the israeli parliament in jerusalem and this is what he had to say I came to ask netanyahu to go or do you have to wait for the end of the war or because you because of your question yes. and your leaders and world leaders that are waiting for the war to stop before uh, they will stop supporting Israeli government, the war would never end. The war would never end as long as Netanyahu is in his office. So I'm crying to the world, don't support Netanyahu. Don't send us weapons. Don't se- send us ships of war. Send us peace. Send us love. Send us reconciliation. I have another question. You say that all of the things... Send us p- peace, send us love, send us reconciliation. Do not send us weapons. Sorry, here's some more bombs. Yeah, I mean... No, no, no. Let's not just send Israel the three point plus, the three plus billion dollars a year that we give them, the top recipient of our military aid in weapons. Let's uh, more than quadruple that figure <laughs> in a short period of time and do $14 billion to aid in the genocide in the bombing of a population that can't even go anywhere without Israel's approval in this two port of travel and, you know, dropping the uh, same amount of bombs in one week in Gaza in a 141 m- square mile area that the United States did in its most its heaviest year, the first year in Afghanistan, a country that's 250,000 square miles. I mean... That makes it clear. But the, but Israel needs more weapons. So, I mean, those the, 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 those those people speaking out against what what the the far right government of Israel is doing from within Israel are some of the bravest people in and it's, like that we can and, highlight and, and standing it's with not Israel. Safe. Yeah, it's exactly not safe for them to do it either, because yep. they, right. there's been videos of extremists in Israel, like a yeah. uh, hardcore far right and Netanyahu supporters physically attacking them. These are these are families who lost people in, uh, in uh, early, earlier last month by Hamas. So these are people whose uh, family potentially might still be alive as yeah. hostages right. uh, held by Hamas. And they're the ones speaking out strongest about, uh, you know, uh, we need to find a way that doesn't just continuously follow this cycle of o- o- eye for an eye. Yeah. And th- that's why I, I stress, I don't say Israelis, uh, I say Zionists, because I, like, I think that, like you said, like, there's not even a monolith among Israelis about this, particularly the people who had family uh, kidnapped are calling for ceasefires and that sort of thing. And Bibi Netanyahu is reportedly like uh, trying to influence them in pretty unseemly ways. But we have this clip of, uh, of a Holocaust survivor on Democracy Now! Uh, I think Putting, uh, coming to Urshu Talib's defense um, and also making this exact same point about basically defund Israel. I totally uh, support uh, her comments. And I think it is on top of that shameful that her justified defense of human lives is considered anti-Semitic. It is pro human beings. I find it horrific that the politicians have the nerve to censure righteous voices for peace and for the lives of Gazans who are being murdered. It is slaughter that is happening. And Rashida Talib is, in my eyes, a hero. Uh, Netanyahu's government 
uh, Israel's policies for decades has been su the suppression of Palestinians, land grabs, uh, deprivation of Palestinians. It is painful for me as, uh, as someone who has experienced all of the terrors that Gazans are experiencing, and even the uh, horrific attacks in Israel by Hamas. But uh, Hamas' attack on Israel does not justify the slaughter of women and children, especially children. I was a child of war. I have experienced all of these things. I have also, I've also known for a fact that what Israel is doing will not end this conflict. It will only exacerbate it. It will increase resistance to anything. I think that Biden needs to defund uh, all of the money that is given to Israel. I think he should not only call for a ceasefire, I think he needs to start thinking about peace. Yep. yep. That's the thing. The ceasefire is the bare minimum. That's the next dialectical step. And, yes. you know, this is a place that you can go back to David Cameron and Ed Miliband in like 2014 or 15. And they're saying, hey, you, um, uh, just because uh, some rockets hit IDF installments doesn't mean you get to flatten apartment uh, complexes. Yes. And also, it's not just a ceasefire that we need. And, that, and so David Cameron said the word ceasefire. Ed Miliband uh, got on him and said, hey, it's not just enough to call for a ceasefire. We need a resolution to what's going on in Gaza and the West bank and actually like so that, that and and that's honestly why we are seeing the political class not want to give into ceasefire because they don't want to uh, address what's after that yep and and and, and i just want to say too i mean to her like people would say well then what is israel going to do without our weapons and, and and you know they still need to defend themselves um I encourage people to check out the interview I did some months ago. You can can you look this up with Anthony Lowenstein when it was um, about his book, The Palestine Laboratory, how Israel exports the technology of occupation around the world. And it is about how the Israeli military industrial complex. I mean, it's now one of the 10 most profitable um in the entire world, despite the relative small size of the country of Israel. And that is because of the decades and decades of military technology that the United States has provided to them. I did this interview in June 8th of this year. Thank you, Bradley. Um, and and it's become self-sustaining at this point. It, it, it's, it's massively wealthy and massively profitable, and they export it to countries like India um, to, to do surveillance on Muslims in Kashmir. So, I mean, like, that, that is, you know, where we are at right now with Israel's capabilities. This is not a country that is lacking for resources on the military and weapons front. Look, if, if we're so important, we get to do, start dictating some of the fucking terms. Yeah. And we are not going to be doing this Jim Crow shit, and we're not going to be doing this dispossession shit we are going to be doing a one state if it's going to be if we're going to pay utopia prices it's not going to be for a jim crow in the desert it is going to be for one state from the river to the sea dem democratic and safe for everyone and i have no problem i'm not like tucker carlson where i'm really worried about like what this costs taxpayers i think we have an obligation to both palestinians and jews in that area to make sure there is peace and that they can live alongside it and actually promote democracy in there um i don't think our state department is really set up to do that but i ultimately think it's a uh, uh, something we are sort of obligated to the world to do after creating this mess. Um, th that's where it's at. Like, it, if you need us so much, then uh, you're going to take some fucking medicine because I'm so sick of seeing the uh, the treatment of even um, um, uh, Palestinians living within Israel. It's disgusting, and I, I I'm not like content with another cent going out this door unless it is to repairing that damage. I just wanted to give a little context of the two people we watched also um, if, for, for people who maybe hadn't watched prior. Um, Mao Zedong um, on October 15th, so only about a week after his parents were killed on October 7th, was on the BBC and said similar something similar. I'm not crying for my parents because he was emotional on the broadcast. I'm crying for all those who lose their lives in this war. We must stop this war. That was only eight days after his parents were killed by Hamas. Um, and then this woman here, Marion Ingram, who we played earlier in the week who had been outside the White House all week protesting um, and calling for a ceasefire. 87 years old, a survivor of the Holocaust. Um, I think sometimes when people do experience and experience, like as you said, 
their family being killed, that immense grief, their uh, experience, some level of apartheid, a level of um, collective punishment. It it does not inspire one to want to commit that against other people. Mm-hmm. It does not it, it does not expire. It does not inspire a compounding interest in extending that apartheid to others or or, or making it so that somebody else experiences that as a result of their experience as a result as a result of their own oppression norman finkelstein's parents were both survivors of the holocaust they were a part of the warsaw uprising the warsaw ghetto uprising and he always says that as his guiding light to um advocate for palestinians because yep. they rose up in in opposition to their oppressors so the palestinians in some respects how could you not see that as a similar fight as a similar friction, as a similar resistance. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm think I'm paraphrasing, but many of the Jewish Voice for Peace activists chant uh, "Never for, again for anyone." 